before I left, I was putting together this, this message for this first Sunday back, and I looked back on my sermon calendar, which I generally put together in January, and I pray through the year, and I pray about what God wants me to speak on, and he had me starting a series on why God doesn't always answer prayer. And I was looking at my calendar going, why? Lord, why would the first Sunday that we're back be the time that you start this? And then as I reflect on our, our trip up to Canada, I kind of go, okay, maybe I'm seeing why. How many of you know that you can pray for a family member for a lifetime and not see any movement? How many of you know it breaks a heart when you don't see movement? And yeah, very honestly, when I, when I went up, I'm going, God, you know, you, last time we went up, I had a chance to share the gospel with my dad, and just before he passed away, he gave his life to Jesus. Now let me have a chance to talk to my mom. And so I went into this conversation thinking, oh, this is the, ch this is the time, this is the opportunity, and my mom shut me down completely. And I left the house, and I went home, and I went to prayer, and I said, God, what do I do? He said, keep praying. I will knock on her heart's door. But if she says no, will you still praise me? And I said, yeah, I will. He said, good, then I will keep knocking on her heart's door. And he said, watch and see. And then very shortly thereafter, I had the opportunity to tell my niece the gospel and lead her to Christ. So praise God for opportunities. But very honestly, you know, we went up to Canada and it was like, okay, God, I'm coming up for, I'm coming up for a rest. And we just arrived on, on the Saturday morning and there's this ding on my phone from Wayne going, are you having restful days? And I'm thinking, no, I spent the last 21 hours driving. <laughs> With two teenagers in the back seat. Oh. One who thinks she's an adult but still acts like a teenager. I hear that voice, and I raise you an amen. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, the first Sunday we went over to, my, to a, a church that is pastored by a friend of mine named Sean. And we walked in the door, and we're sitting down, and we're, we're joining in the church in worship, and there's a lady on the stage. Turns out she actually goes to school with my two daughters, and I've never met her before, but she came off the stage and God said, I, you have a word for her. And I'm like, no, no, pick somebody she knows. I don't know her. I don't know her. No, I, you, you have a word for her. <sighs> grumble, 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 fine, I will. And so after the service, I went up to her and I said, I have a word for you if you're, you're open to it. And, okay. And so I spoke this word to her, and her aunt was sitting, standing there right beside her, and her aunt's eyes got wide as saucers, and her mouth dropped open, and she goes, he's reading your mail. <laughs> and I went, no, God's reading your mail. I'm not. I'm from South Dakota. I haven't seen your mail. <laughs> and she goes, wow, that's exactly what I needed for this situation can I talk to you about this? And so we went off, we had about a half an hour discussion, and God just kept pouring things in, and I kept speaking them out, and she came away from it going, I expected to come this morning and pour into others for, from worship, being on the worship team, but I'm going home full. And I, I, I came away from it going, you know what? Sometimes we go away for a rest and we forget that those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. And waiting isn't, waiting is, how can I serve you? It's more like a waiter or a waitress. It's not waiting like sitting in, in a chair and just hoping that God's going to show up. <laughs> those that serve get served. Those that pour out get filled. And so when I came back, and I'm reading through my sermon again, and realizing it fits. So this morning, we're going to be looking at why God doesn't always answer prayer. But I want you to get a little bit motivated. I want you to get a little bit excited about the potential that God does. Because in my prayer journal, I've got more than 300 answers to prayer this year. More than 300. That's awesome. 
but I don't know how many haven't been because I don't write down. God didn't answer this, didn't it? Because I'm not keeping a record of wrongs. I'm keeping a, a record of yes. And amen. So we should have things that we're praying for for a day. And we should have things that we're praying for for a week. And we should have things that we're praying for for a year. And we should have things that we're praying for for a lifetime. Let's not get discouraged when the things that are on the lifetime list aren't answered this week. Because God wants to know if you're in it for the long haul. He wants to see if you're committed. He wants to see if you're willing to put your heart where your prayer list is. Does that make sense? So I want you to watch this video clip with me. Brandon, can you put that on? Amen. Pastor John Hagee has a way of driving home the importance of prayer, but he under, understated, underplayed, underemphasized it, because nobody can really lift up prayer enough. Nobody can emphasize prayer enough. I don't think anyone this side of heaven can adequately express the power and the importance of prayer because we see with our eyes and we hear with our ears, but the battle is spiritual, it's not physical. Prayer links your hands with those of God. 
Prayer connects your heart with the Father's heart. Prayer is you linking hands, not just with God, but forming a chain link fence of prayer with every other saint on earth and in heaven as they cry out before the throne of grace. But sometimes, sometimes, we feel like God is not answering our prayers. How many of you have ever been there? Sometimes we feel like God is ignoring us altogether. Sometimes we feel like God is absent and we don't know where he is, why he's gone, or when he'll be coming back. Sometimes we feel like God doesn't answer prayer. And over the next number of Sundays, we're going to be looking at just that question, why God doesn't always answer prayer. And God willing, perhaps we can get you motivated to dig into prayer and hold fast to prayer and fight hard in prayer. So why don't we see more answers to prayer? Well, today we're going to look at the most common reason for unanswered prayer. But over the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at other reasons. Today there's only one. And we're looking at it because it's the primary one. And the number one reason why we don't see more answers to prayer is this. We don't really pray. Now, I know that most of us pray. But I also know that the Christian statistics in the United States say that on average, Christians pray for a total of five minutes a week. Across this country... 330 million people, the average Christian prays five minutes a week. We want to move mountains of addiction and world issues, and we only pray five minutes. We want to see a devil defeated and people saved, but we train for five minutes. We're under attack and facing demonic onslaught, and we only practice for five minutes. The reason that the church is weak is because our prayer is weak. Leonard Ravenhill was once quoted saying this, if weak in prayer, we are weak everywhere. And how very true that is. How many conflicts in the church stem back to people trying to do it their way instead of praying and doing it God's way? How many conflicts with church leadership and with friends and family go back to I want my way, not God's way? How many people are only the negative because they aren't following the advice of Paul in Philippians 4.8 where he says whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Well, how is that about prayer, Sean? Well, let me put it bluntly. All of those things point to Jesus. He is true. He is noble and right and pure. He is lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. And if you aren't fixing your eyes and your mind and your heart on him, then you're going to get sucked down the well of criticism and condemnation and negativity. If you aren't spending generous amounts of time in prayer, your eyes are going to wander from the supernatural to the natural. If you see more negative than positive going on around you, you need to pray more. If you're more critical than congratulatory, you need to pray more. If you are more angry than awestruck, you need to pray more. If your issue, your pain, your hurt, your suffering, your trouble is bigger than the one who died on the cross for you, you need to pray more. Because you see, as you focus on Jesus, your stuff will become small. But if you focus on your stuff, your Christ will become small. But that brings us back to the primary reason that we don't see answers to prayer, because we don't really pray. While we were up in Edmonton, uh, my mom is notorious for the fact that she will allow us to say grace before a meal, but it's got to be short. So I've gotten into the habit of, you know, Father, thanks for the food. Amen. My mom's okay with that. Okay. Well, one night we're on supper. We're sitting at the table, and she goes, 
Okay, go ahead and do it. And I said, do what? She said, say it. I said, say what? Grace. I said, amen. She goes, what? I said, now I can tell Micah that you prayed. She goes, oh, oh, sneaky. Yeah, exactly. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. But if I can lead you to pray, I will get you to pray. We don't really pray. Sometimes we shoot up a sky telegram, oh, God, help me here. We might even bow our heads when the pastor says, let's pray, but how worn out is the, is the carpet in your prayer closet? How many answers are on your answer list? How many prayers are on your prayer list? How many tears have fallen as you cry out in prayer? James, the brother of Jesus, the one who wrote the book of James, was actually known for the fact that his knees were, were like the feet of camels. They were so worn out from prayer, from hours and hours kneeling on the ground in prayer, that he could hardly walk. Now, I'm not saying you need to become handicapped because you spend hours and hours praying, but you know what? You can walk and pray. You can drive and pray. I had 21 hours where there was a lot of prayer that was being offered up. Sometimes that I would survive the journey with my <laughs> eyes on Watertown. <laughs> Watchman Nee once said this. He said, prayer is the acid test of the inner man's strength. A strong spirit is capable of praying much and praying with all perseverance until the answer comes. A weak one grows weary and faint-hearted in the maintenance of praying. We don't really pray. And today I'm going to briefly touch on six reasons why we don't. Six reasons briefly. First one is this. We don't really pray for cultural reasons. Growing up in Western Canada, or living in the Midwest like all of y'all, we grow up with a cultural mentality that stems back to our pioneer roots. We have heard phrases like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or God helps those who help themselves. Second perverted edition, chapter 3, verse 12. <laughs> and we have bought into the mentality that I have to do it myself or it just won't get done. We don't like asking for help. We will drive to Walmart at 11 p.m. because we don't like going to our neighbor's house for a cup of sugar. We are trained from childhood to do it yourself, and often our attitude about prayer is kind of like this quote. I don't pray. I do not expect God to single me out and grant me advantages over my fellow man. Prayer seems to me a cry of weakness, an attempt to avoid by trickery the rules of the game is laid down. I do not choose to admit weakness. I accept the challenge of responsibility. And you know what? That seems all right and good and wrong. It flies in the face of what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 5. He says, and when you pray. He doesn't say if. He says, and when you pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. And when you pray. In Matthew 6, verse 7. And when you pray, and Matthew 6, 9 says this, this then is how you should pray. It doesn't say this is how you could pray, or might pray, or think about praying. It says this is how you should pray. Jesus modeled prayer. He taught on prayer. He encouraged prayer. God himself says, Pray, and in Romans 12, 12, Paul says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Stop listening to cultural and start listening to Christ. Pray. Second reason that we don't really pray is this. We don't really pray for natural reasons. On my desk, I have a coaster that says this. Go ahead, Brendan. There we go. Seven days without prayer makes one week. And I keep that to remind me to dig into prayer because my natural tendency is not to bother God with stuff that I can look after. 
And then I'll be sitting at my desk and I will see that coaster and I will remember that God isn't interested in my feeble efforts on my own. He's after what we can do when we link arms together. He is after co-laboring, not my laboring. His strength, my availability, and together we can move mountains. But when I don't pray, I begin to get dragged back into old habits and weaknesses and failings. And when I'm not praying, I get more irritable. And when I'm not praying, I'm more inclined to negativity. And when I'm not praying, I'm less gracious. And when I'm not praying, I'm quicker to anger. I can usually tell if I've had a period of time where I haven't been praying where my wife goes, what's the matter? That's usually an indication. It's almost like my wife's code word for start praying and stop bugging me. (laughs) But we have been taught natural reasons since we were kids. We've been told about coincidences and consequences. We've been told about cause and effect. We've been taught that there's a rational, natural reason for everything. And that unfortunately impacts our prayer life. We start looking for a natural way around prayer. Maybe if I do this, that'll happen. How many of you have ever had that little self-talk going on in your head? You know, maybe if I do this, I, or maybe, maybe tomorrow when I have this meeting with this person, they'll say this. And instead of praying, we start strategizing in our heads. We, we figure out ways around it. We start looking for natural explanations. Well, of course that happened. We start diminishing the supernatural and we start emphasizing the natural. But Colossians 2.8 says this. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Paul was warning about this naturalistic tendency 2,000 years ago. And we are more in need of that warning today than they were then. Nature can't explain why more coincidences happen when I pray. Nature can't explain the miracles that still happen. Nature can't explain because nature is a closed system and God alone has the key. Stop listening to the natural because nature can't explain an empty tomb. God still moves stones. The third reason we don't pray is this. We don't really pray for reaction reasons. Another really unfortunate reason that we don't pray is out of an unhealthy attempt to avoid the prosperity gospel. How many of you love seeing those name it and claim it preachers on TV? You know, it's like, I need another airplane. Give me a million dollars. You know what? Forget him getting an airplane. You can give all of us a million dollars. We see those claiming that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy, and we hear them praying ridiculous things and saying ridiculous things like, suffering is not becoming of a child of God. How many of you know that suffering is promised in the Bible? Okay, Jesus said, in this life you will have nothing but ease. No, he didn't. Nothing but trouble. It's a promise. And we watch as they live luxurious lifestyles and our spirit man gets sick. We hear preachers that use the Bible to justify their their mansions and airplanes and yachts and in an effort to not be like them, we go the opposite extreme. And we stop praying. Because we don't want to be lumped in with those who pray for another million or pray for another jet, but the enemy wins when we stop praying. Pastor Ray Dirksen says this, the key difference between prosperity gospel proponents and us is this, their chief focus is on beseeching God's throne for what they can get for themselves. Our primary focus is on beseeching God's throne for the advancement of God's rule on earth and for others. They pray for them, we pray for those. So let the seekers of wealth seek their wealth. We instead are called to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then we will trust the Father that all these things will be given to you as well. 
God wants to build his kingdom, and prayer is the greatest tool in our arsenal to see that happen. Pray. You may not get a jet, but you might see salvations. Pray. You might not get a million dollars, but you might see a million go towards missions. Pray. You will encounter suffering, but you may also be the reason somebody gets through suffering. Pray. The fourth reason that we don't really pray is this. We don't really pray for guilt reasons. Just like Adam and Eve, when we mess up, we try to hide from God. And the easiest way that we have found as human beings is to stop praying. Maybe if I stop praying, God won't see me. How many of you have ever had a kid where you're you're babysitting, where they they play hide and seek like this? If I can't see you, you can't see me. And that's what we do with God. I'm just going to stop praying, God, and then you won't see me anymore. And we puff on our chest and we look so stupid. We look absolutely ridiculous. You got to wonder if Michael isn't standing up there in heaven beside Jesus going, Really? 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 He's not praying. What? He thinks he, that I don't see what he's doing? Jesus is just patting Michael on the shoulder going, Michael, you never said that I made them super intelligent. <laughs> Sooner or later, Sean will figure it out. Come on, come on, give him a break. After all, he only recently got his rabies shot. (laughs) We think that if we don't talk to God, he'll just miss us or ignore our sins or he just won't bring up the topic. Ever been there? Where you go to prayer and it's kind of like the Spirit of God going, let's talk about the elephant in the room. No, 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 I don't want to do it. (laughs) But here's the thing. God knew Adam had sinned, and he went looking for him. He wants to find you when you've messed up. He wants to talk it out and figure it out with you. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper after Jesus had agreed, after Judas had agreed to betray him, and knowing that Peter was about to deny him. He knew the people and the sin at the table, and he still passed the bread and the cup. Does that sound like a God that wants you to hide? No, because he's already the one seeking. In the context of that setting, Jesus said, If you abide in me and I in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. That's John 15, 5 to 8. And sometimes we miss that. In John 13 and all the way to John 17, those four chapters, they take us through the Lord's Supper. He was talking to people who had already messed up and to people who were going to mess up, and he still tells them to pray. In fact, right there in that that section of Scripture, he goes into his high priestly prayer right there in front of them. Can you imagine how uncomfortable Judas must have been feeling? Oh, Lord, I pray that you make the... Father, let, help them to be one just as you and I are one. And Judas is going... Ugh. You don't have to hide from God. You don't have to, to give him the silent treatment. Stop running away and start running to him. Yes, he will want to deal with the sin. Which is why Sir and Kierkegaard so wisely said this. He said, prayer does not change God but it changes him who prays. But God confronts because he wants to restore relationship, and that requires communication. Pray. The fifth reason that we don't really pray is this. We don't really pray for perseverance reasons. I wonder how many times we give up just before the battle is won. I heard an interview one day on the radio of a man who came to faith in Christ as a result of a neighbor who prayed for him. Now, that doesn't sound noteworthy, except that this neighbor tried talking to him about Jesus many times with no response. And finally, on, on this one day, the neighbor said to him, and he was an older gentleman, he said to this young man who was in his early 20s, he said, I'm gonna fast and pray until you come to faith in Jesus. I want you to think about what that means. 
A week went by with this older man fasting and praying, no results. The second week went by and the old man continued to fast and pray. Three weeks and the older man ended up in the hospital because yes, he was doing a complete food fast. The younger man went and to the hospital and sees him there with IVs in him, asked him to stop fasting. The reply the older man gave is what caught my attention. And it keeps me from forgetting the story. He looked at this young man and he said, have you come to faith in Jesus yet? The young man said, no, and I don't intend to. The older man looked at him and said, then I'm not done fasting and praying. The old man fasted for 38 days. And then he died. And at the funeral, the young man hit his knees beside the casket as it was being lowered into the ground and he gave his life to Jesus because his older neighbor believed he needed Jesus so much that he was willing to die to see it happen. I think I would have quit in the hospital when he said I don't intend to. I think we often quit when it doesn't look like anything is changing. When my mom said, Sean, I won't. I thought about quitting. And then the Spirit of God reminded me, you can't see what I'm doing in the spiritual realm. I didn't call you to quit. I called you to pray. We don't persevere. We don't believe anything will change or anything will happen or that it's worth the effort. We quit because we don't think God hears us but, or because we think he has somehow hit the pause button or, or we think that perhaps his pause is a no. But as Pastor Ray Dirksen said, we are called to pray through or until the situation changes. You don't stop unless he says otherwise. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8 says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. But the Greek translation, the tense there, actually indicates that it would be more accurate to say this, Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. In other words, Keep on praying. Isaiah 62, verses 6 to 7 says this, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent, day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. Give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. To you this morning I'm saying this, take no rest. Never be silent day or night. Paul says, pray without ceasing. But unfortunately, we have turned that around. We've turned it into cease without praying. And then we wonder why we don't see things change. Juliana of Norwich, back in the late 1300s, said this, pray even if you feel nothing. See nothing, for when you are dry, empty, sick, or weak, at such a time is your prayer most pleasing to God. Even though you may find little joy in it, this is true of all believing prayer. 800 years ago, she got it right. Don't quit, keep praying. And the last reason that we don't really pray is this. We don't really pray for fear reasons. Is God good? Amen. Can we trust him? That sounded rather feeble here, folks. Hate to say it, but, you know, considering we are the assembly of God, uh, is God good? Amen. Can we trust him? Amen. The answer is yes. But that doesn't stop us from being afraid at times, does it? Sometimes we're afraid that God won't give us what we're asking for. Sometimes we're afraid that he might ask us to do something out of our comfort zones. Sometimes we're afraid that God will bring up something in our lives that we'd rather he just kind of kept hidden. And I've personally walked through each one of those. I know how uncomfortable 
those fears are, and I know how real they are, but I also know how foolish I feel afterwards when I look back and see how good and trustworthy God has been. Steve Maraboli made this wise assessment. He said, I'm so grateful for the many times God has shown me the mercy of not giving me what I want. Garth Brooks, that great theologian, once said, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. Matter of fact, he sang a song about it. Just before we left for, for Canada, Annie's OPT form. Some of you don't know what that is. It's optional practical training. It's what would allow her to work for a year after her school. It was denied. The government write, wrote this nice letter saying, no. Two full pages to basically say, I confess I was mad. I got this letter. I told Annie she was beside herself. I was angry. Once again, the government was messing around with my family and my plans. But then, then I get a text message from Joe. And she said, heed scripture and know the Lord has a plan. Lay this at his feet and surrender your doubts and fears and or concerns to him. Take a deep breath and thank him for what he's going to do. None of this is a surprise to him. Rest in the assurance of who you know him to be. He wants you well rested for your trip. If you're struggling, read through your list of answers to prayer. <laughs> and she couldn't have done it any more effectively if she'd come up on the stage and smack me. She was right. I have hundreds of answers to prayer showing me and reminding me that God is both good and trustworthy. And this one situation could not stand against all of those. We do need, we do not need to fear. We need to trust. And as Stephen Furtick said, the only way God can show us that he is in control is to put us in situations we can't control. Stop being afraid. Start praying. We are amazing at coming up with reasons and excuses not to do things that are good for us. I don't want to go to the doctor because years ago I was in Stetler sitting and having coffee at Tim Hortons and I had a cold. I, I was struggling. I was coughing and, you know, sinuses are all plugged up. And a friend of mine that I'm having coffee with, he goes, why don't you go and see the doctor? I said, it's Saturday. Doctor's office is closed. Go to the emergency room. And I looked at him and I said, emergency room? Do you know how many people die every day in hospitals? They're the worst place to go. And I hear this choking sound behind me and I turn around and here's this elderly gentleman having lunch with his wife. And she turns around and she gives me this look. She goes, do you know how long I've been convincing him to go to the hospital? Do you think he's ever going to go now that he heard what you just said? We are really good at making excuses not to go. More people die in hospitals than anywhere else. It's not a healthy place to go. More people get healed in hospitals than anywhere else. It is a healthy place to go. And 80% of statistics are made up on the spot. Abraham Lincoln said that. Look it up on Google. <laughs> we are amazing at finding excuses. I don't want to go to the dentist because... Zzz, zzz, okay. I don't want to exercise because... I don't want to stop that habit because the prayer is one of those rare things that is not only good for us, but it's good for others too. You want to see people change? Pray. Billy Graham was right when he said this, before prayer changes others, it first changes us. But please do understand, it will change you. But it will change others too. Let me ask you a question. For those of you 
in this room, all of us here are, for, are in South Dakota right now. How many of you would like to see things change in Washington, D.C.? Then pray. You want to see things change over in the Ukraine? Pray. You want to see things change in your family? Pray. You want to see things change at work? Pray. But if we drill down deep enough through all of the excuses and reasons and rationalizing, what we come to is this, do you know Jesus? Is he your bedrock, your foundation, your anchor, or is he just a name that you've heard and a person that you've heard rumors about? A friend of mine went down to Mexico. He was down in uh, Guadalajara, I believe, and he was in one of the uh, older lying areas of the city, and he went up and he knocked on our door and he said, have you heard of Jesus? And the lady looked at him and said, See, sí, two doors down. <laughs> she knows Jesus. He, he's a neighbor. The language didn't work. But how many times have you ever talked to somebody and like, Hey, do you know Jesus? Yep. Do you? Or do you just know about Jesus? I mean, you ask my son, he can tell you everything there is to know about Marvel. But he doesn't know Chris Evans. He doesn't know Chris Hemsworth. He knows about them, but he doesn't know them. My mother is an avid follower of the royal family. She knows all about Queen Elizabeth, but she doesn't know Queen Elizabeth. There is a difference between knowing about and knowing. Okay? Do you know Jesus? Or do you just know about him? It makes all the difference in eternity. If he is not your fixed point, your north star, then you don't have a solid direction to pray towards. If he isn't your foundation, then you have no solid structure to pray from. If you don't trust in his goodness and his love for you, then you have no basis for faith, and prayer needs faith to activate it. You see, prayer is the Tesla, but faith is the electricity that makes it move. Dig down deep. Stop letting your mind and heart distract you and focus. Is Jesus your Lord? If he tells you to do something, do you do it? If he instructs you to change something, do you change it? He asks you to love people. Do you love them? He commands you to forgive. Do you forgive? Put aside the reasons and the excuses and make sure that you have given your life to Jesus. What does that mean? It means, folks, very honestly, there's only room for one on the throne of your life. God's not going to shove over and let you sit on the cushion while he sits on the other half. Scripture says that he is a jealous God and he will give his glory to no one else. You cannot just have Jesus and. If that's you this morning, maybe you've never surrendered your life to Christ, try this. Lord Jesus, I know that I've been holding on to control in areas of my life, but I'm giving you control of that area right now. I surrender the keys to that closet in my house. I surrender the deed to the house. I am no longer the owner of this house. You are. I am just a tenant in this house. I give you authority. I hold nothing back, and I give you free reign in every area of my life. You are God. You are king. I bow to you. Amen. From that position, with Jesus on the throne and you serving him, pray. Forget the reasons, dismiss the excuses, and pray, because this is when you can expect that the promise found in John 16, 23 will come to be a reality in your life. And that verse says this, Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This position is one of surrender to God's will to God's plan, to God's mission, and to God's determination. If you pray from that position, you're saying, God, here's what I'm praying about. I give you permission for the why, the how, the when, the where, the what. 
I'll lift it up, and I'll let you take it. This is when prayer becomes fun, because you see answers, and you see things change, and you see God move, and you have a hands-off approach, letting God do things his way, in his time, and you get to see it happen. I'm there sometimes, and I'm trying to be there more and more. And when I am, prayer is fun. It's glorious. Why doesn't God always answer our prayers? We wouldn't have to ask that question if we really prayed. So let's pray. Father, prayer always starts with, search me, O God, and see if there is any wickedness in me. So search us, O God. If there are things that we have done that are wrong, we confess them before you and we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, your words, not ours. But Father, from there, we ask you to work in our country. And yes, Father, I lump this as my country now too. We pray for our country, that you would set us in the direction you want us to go, not that we think we should be going. Not the direction that God, I know in my limited wisdom, is the best course of action, but Father, we surrender it to you. We ask you to take us and lead us in your direction. We ask you to put your hand upon this country, Father, and bless. We ask you to bless, Father, whatever that means. Whether it means blessing with difficulty so that we learn to trust you. Whether it means struggle and strife so that we learn to rely on you. We ask you to bless. Because, God, we're not just praying for us. We're praying for our great-great-grandchildren. That there would still be a country called America. There would still be a country based on freedom and democratic principles when they are here and we are not. God, we not, uh, we're not praying short prayers. We're praying long prayers because we want to see our children saved and our grandchildren saved and our great-grandchildren saved. We want to see the gospel of Jesus Christ go around the world and maybe it will take many generations to do that and maybe it will not. But we leave the timing in your hands. God, we know there are those among us who are sick, and we lift them up. But God, some sickness leads to character development because we lean on you. And so, Father, I pray for those that are struggling, that they would struggle into Jesus. And Father, for those that are struggling with finances, God, you did not promise us wealth. You promised us, give us this day our daily bread. So, Father, we pray that you would bless us with contentment. As Paul said, I have learned to be content in plenty, and I have learned to be content in want. I have learned to be content in all situations. Those are your determination, not mine. So, God, I pray that you would bless according to your riches in glory, and that in your wisdom you would pour out on each one in this room what they need, how they need, when they need. And that you would give us a heart and a passion, Father, for those around us, because you always bless that we might be a blessing. You always pour in so that we can pour out. You always, God, strengthen so that we can lift up. Because we're not called to do this race alone. We're called to do this race with and for the purpose of mission and to see your kingdom grow. So, Lord, we do all those things and we lift all those things up out of a place of surrender to you. And, God, we do pray for those in our families who are stubbornly refusing the gospel. Father, we know that your heart is for one more saved. Your word says you desire that none should perish, but all should come to everlasting life. And, God, we're going to hold you on that. So, Father, soften the stubborn hearts. Bring back the prodigals. Open their hearts to the glory of Jesus and pour your spirit into them. We pray all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you. May he fill you. May he strengthen you. May he allow you to see the beauty that is around you. Folks, I look outside and I see the green grass and the trees and the blue sky right now. <sighs> It's glorious what God does. Amen. May he give you eyes to see and ears to hear. But most of all, 
a heart that is tender towards him saying, hey, I've got something for you to do. Go and be Jesus this week. God bless you.